Materials Engineering. Um, if you have not done so already, I would suggest that you pause and print out the um, lecture slides, which are also available on uh, Blackboard, and uh, then you can make notations on them. Also, you can refer back to earlier tables, which may help you answer some of the questions. So before we start, we want to think back to what you did in lab last week. And so we, last week we explained why, um, or last class, why thermal expansion of the different materials is different um, because of bond stiffness or bond strength, and we looked at the types of bonds. But you also ran an experiment where you looked at the hardness or the resistance to surface penetration of several materials. And you notice you should have seen that the brass was significantly harder than the aluminum. And so the question is, why this difference? And the difference is not simply a question of who has stronger bonds. It's not it's just the atomic bond level. Um, it's the difference is really driven by the next level of structure, which is collections of atoms and how they are arranged um, in space. So that next level of structure is the crystal. And crystals are simply three-dimensional repeating patterns of atoms, ions, or molecules. Um, for metals, this is going to be very simple because every point in the lattice will have one atom associated with it. Crystal structures become very complicated in polymers and in uh, ionic materials, particularly minerals, because more than one atom may be associated with one of these points. Um, so don't, don't think that the metals background uh, really prepares you to do crystallography or crystal work in uh, those materials. Um, things get much more complicated. However, metals are quite simple because in general, we have one atom associated with each of these lattice points. Now, the crystal structure is defined by a set of lattice constants. Um, a, B, and C define the lengths of the sides of a unit cell or the basic building uh, block of the larger structure. And then alpha and beta ga and gamma define the angles between the axes uh, for a given structure. <coughs> And the reason that crystals form is that atoms um, organize in these structures to minimize their free energy. So we go back to one of those universal principles, it's the driving force. And what that means is anytime a structure isn't a perfect crystal, anything that causes the structure to be disrupted is going to raise the energy of the atoms. They will have higher energy because they're not in that ideal neighborhood. Now, these are all the possible crystal structures. And um, if this was a material science course, you would have to learn all of these. But this is a materials engineering course, and we're focusing on metals where crystal structure gives us the most uh, useful information that's uh, of general predictive value. And so we're really going to focus on cubic structures and a variety of the hexagonal structure. Uh, we will talk about one of these tetragonals as an intermediate structure. It's going to be very important. But basically, most all metals are either uh, body-centered cubic, see it's a cube with an atom at the center, face-centered cubic, cube with atoms on the faces of the cube. There are a few simple cubes, and then there's a large number of metals that are a variety of hexagonal called hexagonal close-packed. Now, all crystals must be one of these structures. So this encompasses all of the possible arrangements in three dimensions of uh, atoms, ions, or molecules that you can, you can do an infinitely repeating 3D array. So the first of the metal structures is the face-centered cubic. And there are many ways to represent these. Um, this is a classic representation, kind of the stick and ball model. And uh, I know, remember when I was a sophomore in college and my metallurgy professor was talking about these and he would ask us, how many atoms are there in a unit cell? And I'd look at this and I'd say, well, look, there's eight at the corners and there's six on the faces, there's 14. And of course that was wrong. And the key here to recognize is that we want the repeat unit that we're going to stack to build the large array. And if I take this collection of spheres and replicate it, clone it on your desktop, you can't put this array together you have too many corner atoms. You don't have the face atoms that need to fall between these corner atoms and so on. So this is not the unit cell. The unit cell is what is inside of the cube. So all of this atom that's outside the cube is in a neighboring cell. And so this is, in fact, your unit cell. Because if you clone this, 
you can glue it together endlessly and build a three-dimensional array of spheres, and you have all the spheres in the right place. So how many atoms in a unit cell here? Well, there's six on the face, and they're each a half, so that's three. And there's eight on the corners, and each of those is a one-eighth of a wedge. And so you have four atoms in a unit cell. Now, that's all interesting, um, but there's some important features here that, that we want to develop uh, a little bit. Let's begin by looking, though, at what metals are FCC at room temperature. And so these are common metals that you're going to work with as an engineer um, that are FCC at room temperature, aluminum, copper, gold, lead, nickel, platinum, and silver. Now you think about what do these metals all have in common? Well, you might say, oh, okay, they're, they're light. Well, no, aluminum's light, lead's not. Uh, well, here's silver, right? But there's lead. Lead's not expensive. Silver and gold, they're expensive. Platinum's very expensive. Um, it's not their rarity. It's not uh, necessarily uh, their corrosion resistance. They all have reasonable corrosion resistance, but for very different reasons, it turns out. We'll learn about that. Aluminum, because it's actually very reactive. Um, gold is not particularly reactive at all, so their chemistry isn't even similar. But they have something all in common, and that thing they have in common is that they are all very easily deformed. They're soft materials. And they are soft materials, that is, they have a low hardness because they are FCC. So this structure, the FCC structure, makes all of these materials behave in a very similar fashion, even though their chemistry is very different, their densities are different, their rarity is different. And we would never substitute platinum for aluminum in an engineering application, but we can process them in almost identical fashions because of the similar crystal structure giving us those wonderful properties. Now, the other little interesting tidbit here that is going to hopefully disabuse you of um, the way you think the world works coming into this class is the atomic packing factor. And the atomic packing factor simply is the ratio of the volume occupied by atoms to the total volume of the cube. So how much of this is space? Well, 74% of this volume is atoms, and 26% is empty space. Now, it turns out this is the closest packing you can have with a bunch of spheres, 74%. So this is called a close-packed structure. Now, your intuition would say, if I pack more atoms into the structure, it should be stronger. And in fact, that's wrong. This is not, doesn't have anything to do with how strong this is. In fact, we're going to see non-close pack structures that are considerably stronger, considerably harder to deform. And the key is the relative positions of these atoms makes it easy to rearrange them. And so these metals are all very easily deformed because of this FCC structure, even though it's a closed pack system, they are not particularly strong materials. Now, there's a lot of stuff we can do with geometry, and we will look at this in class, but since you are all budding engineers, you should be able to sit down and tell me how you can relate the lattice constant here, that is the, so the length of these sides, to the radius of these atoms. If you look in your textbook, there's a nice magic table in the flyleaf that has all the a lot of the elements, and they give you the atomic radius. Now, how do you measure an atom? Well, it's kind of hard to measure an atom. You need really small calipers. So we don't measure the atoms. A common technique is to use x-rays, and the x-rays allow us to measure the length of this side, what is the um, unit cell dimension. And from the unit cell dimension, you can then calculate the radius of the atoms. And uh, this is simple trig, Pythagoras at work here, right? You have a side and a side. These are both length A, which is the lattice constant. So I have A squared plus A squared is going to equal R squared. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, 4R. It's going to equal 4R squared. And you got to do your Pythagoras. So we'll do that in class, and you should be able to do it on your own. So to summarize, FCC metals, what do we want to remember about these? They are easily deformed. We would say they are soft, or they have low strength, or as you saw in lab, they have low hardness. In addition to this, they do not harden as they deform, at least not very rapidly. We would say they are malleable. So as you begin to deform them, most all materials, almost all materials, as you deform them, they become stronger. 
FCC materials do that at a very slow rate, and so you can easily draw them into wire or film or foil because deformation doesn't make them stronger uh, very rapidly. The other thing that falls out of this FCC structure is that you can usually draw them a lot before they will fail. So we would call that ductility. So these are important terms. Soft, that is low hardness or low strength, means it's easy to deform them. They don't become more hard, more difficult to form, uh, to form that's malleability, and then ductility is how much you can deform them before they fail. And those terms we're going to throw around the rest of the semester, so get them straight now. All right, going to body-centered cubic. Same question or same issues. Here's your most common models. This is not the unit cell. It's what's inside the cube, so I love this model. You should, too. How many atoms in a unit cell here? This one's almost trivial. Obviously, two. And if you can't figure that out, pause the video until you get it. All right, so two in the unit cell. Now we go to the APF, and we see this is not a close pack structure. So again, your intuition before this class would have told you, well, not close packed, it should be weak. Except look, let's look at who's BCC at room temperature. Chrome, iron, molybdenum, um, phosphorus, sodium, tantalum, tungsten, vanadium. And if you're a tool nut, you know that good tools are chrome, vanadium, steel, um, or chrome, molybdenum, vanadium, steels. These are hard, strong, difficult to deform materials and it's inherent to their crystal structure. They don't all have high melting temperatures. Sodium doesn't melt at a very high temperature. Um, now, these, some of these are pretty high, but this isn't fundamentally a question of bond strength. This is a question of the arrangement of the atoms again, and BCC materials are hard. So, same kind of calculation. Now what we have is uh, you have to do Pythagoras in three dimensions because we have a diagonal through the center of the cube. Here's my four radii, one, two, three, four. But now I have a squared plus a squared plus a squared to get all three dimensions in. And so you end up with a slightly different relationship between the radii and the lengths of the sides. So we'll do that in class as well. So again, to, rem to remind you, this is what you need to really hang on to. BCC metals are generally going to be harder and stronger than FCC metals. They will not deform as much before failure. That is, they will not be as ductile, and they are going to harden rapidly as they deform. They're going to get stronger, and so they are not as malleable as FCC metals. And then finally, we have hexagonal close packed. The structure is the hexagonal structure with an extra. There's actually two hexagonal systems interlaced. So this is a triangle from another unit cell that's interlaced. But this is a close pack system. So atomic packing factor is 0.74. Well, what did FCC do at 0.74? FCC materials were not very hard, not very strong, quite ductile. Well, HCP metals are not very strong. Zinc, magnesium um, are not hard, strong materials. Cadmium, cobalt, and zirconium, not particularly strong materials or hard materials. Say, so, well, at least with FCC, where things were really ductile, right? Well, HCP metals kind of have the worst of all worlds. They're not very strong, and they're not very ductile. If you've ever stepped on a Hot Wheels car, and if you're a parent, you probably will, or when you're a parent, you probably will, in the middle of the night, um, you will find that after you've squished it, you cannot restore it to its original shape. When you try to do that, it will crack. And that's because Hot Wheels cars are made out of zinc. And zinc is HCP, and HCP metals are not strong, so when you step on it, it bends. And they're also not ductile, so when you try to straighten it, it breaks. And that's a characteristic of HCP metals. So you might ask, well, why do we use them? Well, you know, these are very easy to mold. Magnesium is tremendously light. Cobalt and zirconium have fantastic chemical properties, corrosion resistance, so does cadmium. Cadmium has important electrical properties. So we don't use these for mechanical structures unless weight is critical in magnesium or unless we want them to be very easy to mold, which is what we do with zinc, where zinc is competing with plastics, and even a weak metal is stronger than plastic. So, so zinc wins because of its low, mold, low molding temperature, magnesium because of its extremely low weight, um, and then these because of wonderful corrosion resistance and high temperature properties. But these are not really structural metals in terms of being efficient um, in giving you strength. Uh, 
So, general characteristics, they tend to be soft, as we've already said, not particularly strong. Um, they'll harden rapidly as they deform, so that's, they're not um, malleable, and they're not particularly ductile. They tend to fail at fairly low strains. Okay, so that's the three basic crystal structures, and we need to introduce a few other terms um, that are going to be relevant as we talk about microstructure and how it drives properties. And the first of these is that most materials are actually... Um, at the fundamental level, anisotropic. And anisotropic means not isotropic. So isotropic materials, properties do, are independent of direction. Particle board is a great example of an isotropic material. Um, we take wood, chop it up, glue it together. The wood particles are oriented in all different directions. And so you have the same pretty bad properties in all directions in particle board. Wood, however, you're, if you've worked with wood at all, you know that the grain direction is very strong, but perpendicular to the grain, wood is not particularly um, strong material, and it will crack easily. And so you have, if you're making firewood, because um, you live up north, you're going to split the wood along the grain. You're not going to, if you have to cut perpendicular to the grain, you have to saw. You use a chainsaw or a crosscut saw. But if you want to break the wood this direction, you don't usually cut it, you split it, you just wedge it apart because it's not particularly strong in that direction. So this is anisotropic, properties depend on direction. This is isotropic, I get the same properties in all directions. Now, turns out individual crystals are anisotropic. If we look at the structure of silicon, it's pretty obvious. If I pull this unit cell in this direction, and I pull, or I, I pull it this way, I'm going to get different behavior than if I pull it in this direction. And in fact, we can measure the stiffness, um, and the, the term, engineering term, we will spend a lot of time with in a few weeks is modulus. But the resistance to deformation of this crystal um, depends on direction. In the x and the y direction, in the in-plane directions here, the modulus is about 169 GPA. In the vertical direction, though, the modulus is 130 GPA. So, that's about a 25 or 30 percent difference, and you might say, well, that's just you know, small, but most engineering design is done with margins of safety on the order of 20 or 30 percent. So obviously, the property difference is as great or greater than our margin of safety, and uh, we're not going to be able to tolerate that kind of uh, variation. So we say, oh, great, so we're going to have several properties, right? Well, it turns out that when we look at metals, which we're going to be working with the next few weeks, there really is only one modulus. Now, this is the modulus of elasticity that we were just talking about for a bunch of different metals as a function of temperature. And what we find is, yes, as the temperature increases, the modulus does drop. So we have a temperature dependence. But notice, here's aluminum. There's one curve for aluminum. There's no EX, there's no EY, there's no EZ, there's just E. And the same is true for all of these other metals. This is engineering design data. You actually could go to this to do serious design work. That's the intention. Um, and they're not giving you any other information, which means engineers must not care. And why do we not care? Well, we don't care because most metals are polycrystalline. That is, they are made of many crystals. It's one big piece but made of many crystals. Now, the, the reason this happens, or the way this happens, is when we are solidifying the metal. You have a pot of molten metal here. And this classic illustration from probably the 1930s that has been in every materials textbook since um, doesn't even use something that looks like real crystals, but whatever. We begin with the initial solids um, precipitate, and you get nuclei. These are called nuclei. They're the little bitty bits of crystal solid that have formed as cool atoms collect. Now, they're floating in this liquid matrix, and so they're going to be randomly oriented. And as atoms join, they will line up with the crystal orientation of this piece or this piece, but those don't align with each other. And so as they meet, they cannot become one crystal, you end up with mismatches at the boundaries of the crystals, and you get grain boundaries. And in lab this week, you are cutting and polishing bolts, and you're looking at this structure. You're looking at what is the arrangement of these polycrystals, and um, how, how big are they, um, 
Do they have common shapes? Other questions that you're going to want to answer. And we're going to address those in quite a bit of detail in our next session. Um, so most metals are polycrystals. Now, these all have random orientation, so this grain may be anisotropic, but its axis is this way. The neighboring grain's axis is different. When you average them all together, it all washes out and you get one property. Now, you need to be aware if manufacturing has oriented the crystals. This doesn't happen a lot, but you see it frequently, especially in highly rolled products, uh, like steel I-beams, maybe. Um, you get an orientation of the grains, and suddenly everybody's aligning in the same direction, and now you have some anisotropy, even in the stiffness of the material, not just in strength and toughness, which is where we will expect to see that um, a great deal. So be aware. We assume isotropic properties, but it's easy, fairly easy to mess that up a little bit with your processing. The next important concept related to our crystalline materials is uh, polymorphism. A polymorphic material is many morphs, and you think of morph as changing the shape, but in the fundamental sense, it just means shape or structure. And so when you're morphing something, that's now a verb, but in the classical sense, it just means the shape of something. So a polymorphic material has more than one crystal structure possible. And iron is kind of the champion polymorph because at high temperature, it's body-centered cubic. As you cool it, it turns into face-centered cubic. And as you cool it further, it becomes body-centered cubic again. Now you say, well, that's interesting, but does it matter? Well, here's polymorphism in action. Let's think about this. Remember, FCC materials are very soft and malleable. So a silversmith works with his silver bowl and his anvil and his hammer, and he's holding this with his bare hand because silver is face-centered cubic, and so it's very, very easy to deform, and he just gonna, he's going to hammer it and hammer it, and he can do a tremendous amount of deformation. A blacksmith, on the other hand, you'd think there's a lot of similarities, but these guys don't cross-train much because the blacksmith has to work the metal hot. And the reason he has to work it hot is he's working with iron. Well, iron at room temperature is body-centered cubic. Body-centered cubic materials are hard, strong, not very malleable, not very ductile. He's trying to shape this into useful objects. So he heats it, you go back, heats it up this line, and he turns it into face-centered cubic iron. We call that austenite. You'll learn about that in a few weeks. And that face center cubic iron then is easily formed, and then he can make all kinds of wonderful things, cool them down, and they become body center cubic, and therefore hard and strong again, and so they hold their shape. So if you ever get a chance to go to Williamsburg or to the Texas Folklife Festival and watch a blacksmith work, you're seeing someone take advantage of metallurgical principles that they didn't even know about, that were determined by trial and error, and... Uh, You'll also see someone who has a fantastically calibrated eye because he can tell, he or she, some master blacksmiths in the United States now are women, um, can tell the temperature of the steel by its color to within very few degrees. And uh, with practice, they can be within 10 degrees or so uh, to get the right color. So summarizing, polymorphic having different crystal structures. Allotropic means the same thing but it applies to a pure element only. And so we won't use the term much. You may hear it, um, but polymorphic means having different crystal structures or changing crystal structures. Polycrystalline means having many crystals. And then finally, uh, a term that we're not going to deal with much in metals, um, but we'll, that is very important in ceramics and polymers, and that's amorphous. And amorphous material has no long-range structure. Amorphous ceramics, uh, important materials like window glass um, that you all used today when you came to school. Uh, in the polymer world, amorphous polymers are usually uh, used in for their transparency. So if you're wearing eyeglasses right now or safety glasses in lab, those are mostly amorphous polymers. And that is there is no crystalline structure in the material. So to summarize, you should be able to tell me when you come to class, um, what are BCC, FCC, and HCP? What do they stand for? Um, if a metal turns from BCC to HCP structure as it is heated, is it polymorphic or polycrystalline? Do you know the difference in those terms? 
when metals go from BCC to FCC, what happens to the volume of the material? You may want to go back and look and think through that. We're going to wrestle with that in class. And you do need to understand or remember at this point, what are the general characteristics of a BCC, FCC, and HCP crystal structure? So until next class, have a good day.